Hey guys, for CED Magazine's Live from the Show, I'm Stuart Schley at Cable Show 2014. I want to talk briefly about television. You go home, you turn it on, it works. There's no rebuffering and no waiting. It's a very hearty, proven medium. The same cannot always be said for the vast world that is the open internet, where uh, murky things happen and video streams can be uh, lost in the dust if we're not careful. There's a reason I'm talking about this, because today I'm with Conviva and Keith Zuptovich, who's Chief Strategy Officer. Um, Keith, this is the world you guys traffic in and work in all the time. Before we start, what do you do and how are you helping to tame this beast that is video over the internet? Well, you mentioned the trans transformation of television from what is traditionally a controlled head-end publishing network moving over to what is a very volatile, uncontrolled, mismanaged internet. And everyone has to share it, it's very volatile. And basically, you're sharing video streams now. No longer are you watching television on a television medium. You're watching television on the same medium, on the same wire, that your email comes through, your web pages are coming through, and in some cases, your voice is going over. So that's now becoming a shared, very volatile network. And Conviva saw that problem very early on. The founders of Conviva always felt that there was going to be an issue when video came onto the internet because it would be what our founders called the elephants, because the internet started with mice, and they actually literally called them elephants and mice. That, that packet delivery email web pages were mice. They were very small packets. There was collision uh, detection, meaning that if your web page took a little longer to load, it was not that big of a problem. Or if it came in a little slower, a little faster, it was no big deal. Video coming was an elephant package. Now you're talking about, well, back then it was hundreds of KB, but now we're talking, you know, megabytes, of, megabits of, of, uh, of video sizes. And those are elephant sized packages coming down the internet. Not only are they bigger, there's actually more of it. So now more and more people are putting more and more video online. And again, you look at that from a shared network, volatile network, uncontrolled network topology, and you have these massive elephants running with mice, everything's colliding. And in video, those collisions are buffering. And, That's and where the spinning wheel or the video stopping happens. The dreaded spinning wheel, and yet we're putting more and more elephant, we're all entering this new domain and we're entering it fast. So what are the business motivations for this rush to embrace the internet as a delivery medium? Well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that there was necessarily a business motivation. It's really a serendipitous change for consumers because it was really driven by Gen Ys, you know, my kids who are, you know, teenagers. They weren't watching television. Once they found that they could consume content on their laptops, whether it be in the home, in their bedrooms, or whether it be in college dormitories, they started to consume more and more content online. And so as they started to age, basically more and more television consumers started watching more and more television online. And, and therefore, it became this new medium for delivering video. And there's real benefit, though. I have to point out, there's real benefit. Under the today's television model, the publishers, the studios, have zero visibility to their exact audience. And you know, Nielsen as a measuring tool, as a sampling tool, you know, there's all kinds, you can pull up all kinds of papers around its real efficiency and how much it's really accurate. So there really is no way for publishers to see who's watching their content. It's a deal struck with operators and, and it's sort of a best guess. Mm -hmm. The internet now can take publishers directly to a consumer. So now there's a direct tie. Publishers can for the first time establish a real-time connection to every single viewer and see exactly what's being watched. So it offers some benefit. Give me a snapshot of a day in the life for Conviva. How many streams are you guys helping to manage, organize, and what are you doing to and with them? So, to, so the, the company started and we went to the publisher space, primarily the premium publisher space. We started at the very high end of the market because their content was most valuable. They would value quality. And, and as they were publishing content on this, again, volatile network, all of their audiences were you know, receiving the buffering spinning wheel of death, or they were receiving low pixelation. They were receiving bad, bad quality. So when we built Kaviva, we knew that there was a need for an internet control platform. Because when you talk about variability of the internet, the logical response to that is control. You have to somehow get control of your video. On the head-end publishing network, there was massive control. Now you've got to somehow say, I've got to get control of the internet. The best way to do that is to control the endpoints. So Conviva said, the most important thing you can measure isn't the health of the internet. It's what's actually being consumed in the video player. So, so, so Conviva is an, an application side data feed. We have that code in the, in the application layer that basically feeds back to a central control platform. And it does two things. The first thing it does is it gives a complete audience, a real time pulse of the entire audience. Everything being consumed at all times. Device. Device, what they're watching, what's going on in the player, the bit rates, the rendering rates what CDN, what ASN, what ISP, what content, everything you can imagine, you're now getting to see within the audience. The second thing it does is, as it's collecting that information, 
the platform is making real-time predictive decisions on dual paths and bitrate changes that are necessary to get through this volatile internet. That, those are the two major impacts, is congestion and, and outages. Those are the two things that get all over the internet. And you know, there's a lot of attention paid today to content delivery networks and, and, and peering relationships and edge servers as um, a possible solution to congestion, but that's not enough. That's not enough. It's, it, because, be, because television, again, the compare and contrast models, to television today, when I want to watch a program, I go and I put it on a specific channel at a specific time. Now, TiVo allows me to, to sort of time shift and I can watch it when I want to watch, but the publishing aspect and the delivery aspect to me is done on a specific channel at a specific point in time. Internet consumption isn't like that. Everything's there. Everything is when I want to watch it. My kids and I can watch the same exact program in two different rooms and start the program a second apart. And now we have two completely different streams on the internet. That human behavior, patterns and what we're going to watch and how and where is totally unpredictable. So if you plan capacity to solve that problem, you're only solving the aggregate problem. You can never address the, the micro problem of exactly what resources within your aggregate capacity you end up getting flooded. You don't know if 10 times more people are going to watch video content in LA, for example. So you may have thought you had enough aggregate content, but maybe you didn't have enough edge capacity in LA. There's no way to know that. So you're constantly moving streams around and finding optimal places to deliver. Absolutely. There's two decisions we can make at all times. Is that first and foremost, we can midstream switch streams to healthy resource. So if it's a resource congestion issue and there's and there's available resource somewhere else, we can take a viewer without with completely unbeknownst to the viewer, we can take their stream and literally move it around the internet. And I'm just, I'm without still just watching and it's Absolutely. working fine. If there's a point where we can't move it and it's an edge device and there is no other option, we can take all the streams down and lower the bitrate so that everyone continues to watch video. The biggest impact of video today is the video stopping. Right. So that's the thing we want to avoid first. Because that creates abandonment. People Absolutely. Give up. Yeah. I don't want to watch a blank screen. I'm, I'm willing, although not completely happy, willing to watch maybe not as clear a picture. Although we can show that both impact engagement. But again, our platform is trying to solve that problem the best we can. We solve 90 plus, 95 plus percent of video streams on the internet, any problems they may have. So we're at the cable show, obviously. Um, can you talk a little bit about your relationships with the cable industry and how you're helping to um, bring some of these companies and content providers into this new world? You know, it, it's interesting because for us, the operator segment is probably the most uh, exciting segment that we can talk to, for one reason, quality. Now, if you think about today, the operator segment in television, most of the operators have specific homes in which they have the subscribers. You, know, you talk to a, a Cablevision or a Comcast or a Time Warner, they'll tell you, I have 25 million homes. They own those homes. If you want to tell cable television, you have to pick up the phone and you call Cablevision or you call Comcast in your area. The internet no longer has those rules. So now all of a sudden you have all these cable operators that no longer have walls built. It's a free for all, it's a wild west. Subscriber acquisition is everyone's game. Layer on top of that, you now have traditional satellite players who never competed with Comcast at Time Warner in the ground. They were com competing over satellite. Now they're coming over under the ground. Yep. So now you have this situation where subscribers have choice. They can pick any operator they want and content is ubiquitous. So what becomes the number one currency for the operator space today? If, con if content is ubiquitous, it can be consumed and acquired through any one of the operators and the operators no longer own a specific home, it becomes about who has the best quality. Right? If I go to watch my subscription on any carrier's television package and it buffers, I'm going to cancel that subscription and I'm going to find one that delivers a high quality experience. And in video, quality is everything. But to the operator space, it's, the, it's number one. It's got to be number one. Is that They have to make the decisions on subscriber acquisition based on can I deliver the highest possible quality experience. And that's where we can come in and help them. I was going to say, I was going because there's a lot to talk about what I was going to close with. What, what would be your, your chief strategy officer? Yeah. Strategic to advice to a cable operator who's now in this new environment you just described where everybody can sort of do the same thing. Yep, yep. Uh, number one, it would be, th there's, a, there's a couple things that are going to change, in my opinion, in, in the television shift. One is you know, live linear programming. Live linear programming happens in traditional television because it has to. That's how television is broadcast. Online, you, know, the, you have the ability to go find content and watch it whenever you want. Mm -hmm. So that's the first paradigm shift is that I, I believe we're going to move away from live linear to really a catalog based TV delivery system, more like a VOD TV system. So, so from an operator standpoint, build a relationship with all the publishers in which you can now transact. You know, television is really a reseller business. That, that's what television is. 
Operators buy content from publishers and they resell it to the home. Mm -hmm. Establish that very same sort of an architecture where you can get onto a content-based reseller relationship with all your publishers while optimizing every single viewer's experience to the highest possible quality with Convivo. We, we fundamentally believe, in, and, and we, we built the company on it obviously, and we we're continuing to have tremendous success, that just building a network and having basic network tools and routing features is not enough in video. You have to have an application layer, real-time monitoring and optimization platform, and that's where we come in. We can offer that to an operator and give them differentiated advantage. And leave me with an optimistic reason to believe that video is not going to break the internet. Well, it, it, when you say break the internet, in, in total it won't, but it does every day, right? That's why screens go black, is because something in the internet broke. And so that's where the, just the topology itself will always break. It will always have very small fires. The job of the publisher and the operator is to try and navigate those fires so that viewers aren't impacted by them. And if a fire flares up on an edge device, you have to be able to, if I'm watching my six o'clock program, I don't care that you had a server go down. I'm there to watch that program. I won't take an excuse for an answer because I'm not used to that, especially on large screen television. It's not your frame of reference. Absolutely. This is not a market that's that's popping up from nowhere. This is an evolving market that's coming from a 64 inch HD picture with zero interruptions and zero delay coming over to my television through a new medium that I don't have to understand how it works. As, a, as someone who's writing a check for that content, it better work. So, so avoid those fires, and the only way to do that is to have some control platform that gives real-time stream optimization, and that's where we come in. High expectations, a congested internet, and here's the guy who can solve it all. Keith, thanks for taking some Absolutely. time with Thank us you. today. Thanks for your time. For Live from the Show, CED Magazine, I'm Stuart Schleid.